welcome to my show on civil rights. My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm one of the radio hosts for the New Heights show on education and the New Heights Educational Group. I hope you enjoy the show and I'm asking our listeners to consider becoming a sponsor as we are no longer sponsored by Silicon Valley High School. This show is pre-recorded. Today, I will talk about the abolitionist Harriet Beecher Stowe. Taken from an article written by Joan D. Hedrick, doi.org, published in print 1999, published online February 2000. Stowe Harriet Beecher, author, was born in Litchfield, Connecticut, the daughter of Lyman Beecher, a clergyman, and Roxana Foote. Her father, one of the most popular evangelical preachers of the pre-Civil War era, was determined to have a role in shaping the culture of the new nation. Her mother, from a cosmopolitan novel reading Episcopal Palian family studied painting and executed portraits on ivory. After bearing nine children, she died when Stowe was five. Stowe's father quickly remarried, but from this point, Stowe's sister, Catherine Beecher, became the strongest female influence in her life. A precocious child with a quick memory, Stowe stood out even within the remarkable Beecher family. Observing her oddity and genius, her father said he would give $100 if she were a boy and her brother, Henry Ward Beecher, a girl. At age eight, she entered the Litchfield Female Academy, an excellent school founded to vindicate the equality of female intellect. There, the strongest influence on her was John Brace, whose methods of teaching composition she later imitated. She was an eager writer in what Brace called this literary loving school. Her first assignment was an essay on the difference between the natural and moral sublime, a topic Stowe noted not trashy or sentimental, such as are often supposed to be the staff of female schools. At age nine, she volunteered to write weekly essays. At age 13, she won the honor of having her composition read aloud at the annual school exhibit, where it made her father sit up and ask who the author was. When the answer came, your daughter, sir, Stowe experienced what she later called the proudest moment of my life. Cross volume one, page 399. In 1824, Stowe entered Catherine Beecher's Hartford Female Seminary where she studied the most difficult subjects in the male college curriculum, including Latin and moral philosophy, and aspired to become an artist like her mother. Although she painted throughout her life and left some remarkable accomplished canvases, her true vocation was to paint with words. From 1829 to 1832, she taught composition at the Hartford Female Seminary, and at age 19, wrote to her brother George, who, like all of her brothers, entered the ministry. It is as much my vocation to preach on paper as it is that of my brothers to preach viva voce. In 1832, she moved with her family to Cincinnati, Ohio, where her father had accepted the presidency of Lane Seminary. While her father campaigned to save the West from the influences of infidelism, and Roman Catholicism, Stowe observed new customs and relished the dialect spoken at the Cincinnati landing. Her literary career blossomed. She published a widely adopted primary geography, 1833, that won the praise of the Bishop of Cincinnati for her tolerant views of Catholics, taught in Catherine Beecher's Western Female Academy and participated in the social and literary gatherings of the semi colon club for which she wrote many of her early essays and stories pioneering the use of dialect and reflecting on customs in a native new england many of these writings were published in the western monthly magazine 
and were collected in her first book of fiction, The Mayflower, 1843. In 1836, she married Calvin Ellis Stowe, a biblical scholar and professor at Lane Seminary. With his encouragement, she became a literary woman, regularly adding to their slender finances by contributing sermons and temperance tales to the New York Evangelist and writing stories for Godet's latest book and various gift books. During their 50-year-long union, Calvin Stowe remained a judicious advisor and staunch supporter of Harriet Beecher Stowe's literary career, but their domestic life was made difficult by their temperamental differences. Seven children, money problems, Calvin's hypochondria, and Harriet's haphazard domestic management. In 1843, moved by the millennium spirit of the times, and by the suicide of her brother George, Stowe experienced a deepening of her faith, a second birth, more meaningful than her first conversation experience at age 14. Her profound identification with Christ as a man of sorrows and lover of the lowly helped her through years of poverty, ill health and domestic difficulty, and informed her most famous fiction. In 1849, their 18-month-old son, Samuel Charles, died in a cholera epidemic that swept Cincinnati. It was at his dying bed and at his grave, Stowe wrote of Charlie, that I learned what a poor slave mother may feel when her child is torn away from her. When the passage of the fugitive slave law the following year implicated the North in such, just, in such, in just such family separations, Stowe began writing, Uncle Tom's Cabin, serialized in the national era between June the 5th, 1851 and April the 1st, 1852, the story had a huge following and sold more than 300,000 copies in the United States during the first year after it was published in book form by J.P. Jewett in 1852. Drawing on the familiar genre of the slave narrative, but casting it in a fiction bristling with regional types and racy slang, Stowe wrote what was recognized at the time as a great American novel. Uncle Tom's Cabin follows the fortunes of Tom, a faithful slave who is sold away from his family and Eliza and George Harris, who flee their bondage in Kentucky. As the Harrises make their way towards Canada and freedom, Eliza by Her by crossing the ice of the Ohio River with her child, George, by impersonating a white man. Tom is sent deeper into slavery. He is purchased by August St. Clair at the behest of his younger daughter, Evangeline, Eva, who on their deathbed urges her father to flee Tom. But St. Clair is killed in a tavern brawl, and Tom is sold again. Under the tyrannical power of Simon Legree, on a plantation on the Red River in Louisiana, Tom dies from a beating. The story was immediately put on stage, translated into dozens of languages, and embodied in popular culture in the form of songs, toys, and figurines. The impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin on the conscience of the nation, already tender from the outrages of the fugitive slave law, was such that when Stowe came to the White House in 1862, Abraham Lincoln is said to have greeted her with the words, So you're the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. Charles Edward Stowe and Lyman Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe, The Story of Her Life, 1911, page 203. The success of Uncle Tom's Cabin made Stowe an international celebrity and a focus of anti-slavery sentiment. In 1853, she published A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, an anti-slavery polemic written to answer critics who complained that a novel had exaggerated the brutalities of slavery. At the invitation of two Scottish anti-slavery societies, she undertook a tour of the British Isles, as she recounted in Sunny Memories of Foreign Lands, 1854, she was met by large crowds feeded at anti-slavery stories, showered with money for the cause and presented with a petition for more than half a million British women urging their American citizens, 
urging the American sisters to end slavery. She used money given her to free slaves, distribute anti-slavery literature, and support anti-slavery lectures, but for her most powerful anti-slavery weapon remained her pen. In 1854, when Congress was debating the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Stowe published in The Independent an appeal to women of the free states of America on the present crisis of, on our country and circulated petitions to defeat the bill. When it passed, opening the possibility of slavery in the new territories, Stowe wrote her second anti-slavery novel, Dread, The Tale of the Great Dismal Swamp, 1856, in contrast to the Christian pacifism of Tom in Uncle Tom's Cabin, her hero Dread is presented as a son of Denmark Visa. The historical figure hanged in South Carolina for fomenting rebellion among the slaves. The following year, her 19-year-old son Henry Ellis, a freshman at Dartmouth College, died while attempting to swim the Connecticut River, struggling with the probability that he had died unregenerate. Stowe wrote The Minister's Woo in 1859, the first of her New England novels and a liberal reworking of the Calvinist theology of her upbringing. It was serialized in the Atlantic Monthly, a prestigious new journal Stowe helped to found. Based in part on materials from her mother's life, the minister's wooing participated in the mythification of New England that was central to the Atlantic Monthly's cultural mission. During the Civil War, as opportunities to make money through authorship multiplied, Stowe was foremost among professional writers. In 1862, she published Agnes of Sorrento, inspired by her, by her trip to Italy on her third tour of Europe in 1859-1860, to 1860, and The Pearl of Oars Island, the second of her New England novels, and continued to write occasional columns for The Independent. In 1864, she instituted in the Atlantic a monthly column on household topics, rightly gauging the pulse of the nation during the Civil War. The public mind, she wrote her editor, James T. Field, is troubled, unsettled, burdened with the real. Home is a thing we must strike for now. After her husband retired in 1863, Stowe became the sole support of a large family. She continued her domestic columns in the Atlantic for three years, wrote children's stories, a volume of poetry titled Religious Poems in 1867, and a collection of biographies called Men of Our Times, 1868. She also bought a home in Mandarin on the St. John's River, becoming one of the first northerners to winter annually in Florida. The weight of these commitments and various domestic difficulties such as the alcoholism of her son Frederick, who was wounded in the Civil War, did work on her third New England novel, Old Town Folks, 1869. Hetium of New England Life and Law. It was based in part on her husband's recollections of life in Natick, Massachusetts, with Donald G. Mitchell, Ike Marvel. She was co-editor of Hearth and Home in 1868 but resigned in 1869 to write Lady Byron Vindicated, 1870, the story of Lord Byron's incestuous relationship with his half-sister, Augusta Lee. Right now, you might be struggling through your classes or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group, educational resources to help reach your goals. Hello, listeners. If you're enjoying the New Heights show on education and want to support or donate to our organization, please visit www.newheights.org education.org and while you're there check out our online store welcome back to the new height show on education 
My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm the radio host for this show. This show is pre-recorded and focuses on the history of civil, civil rights. I will continue the show with the life of Harriet Beecher Stowe. This strange chapter in Stowe's career can best be understood in the context of the politics of Reconstruction America when the push for civil rights for black men was fanning into popular sentiment similar goals for women. Stowe herself embraced women's suffrage at this time and briefly entertained the possibility of an alliance with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who tried in 1869 to recruit her to write for their paper, The Revolution, and who were calling attention to the sexual double standard by highly publicized public meetings on sexual scandals. Stowe, who all her life had used the cloak of male power and the posture of true womanhood to pursue her sometimes quite radical goals, balks at this overt alliance on women's issues. However, she used her acquaintance with Lady Byron to write what she may have intended to be the Uncle Tom's Cabin of women's sexual slavery. It was a miscalculation. Bravely mentioning incest, but narrowly defending the honor of an aristocratic English woman's pure and Christian life, Stowe succeeded only in provoking a torrent of abuse in the press. Burned by this incident, Stowe never again attempted direct speech on sexual matters. However, in a society novel's Pink and White Tyranny, 1871, My Wife and I, 1871, and We and Our Neighbors, 1875, Stowe used a loosely plotted journalistic fiction to comment on women's roles, reform, and domestic politics. She brought her literary career to a close with Poganoke People, 1878. Fictionalized reminiscence of growing up in Litchfield, she died in Hartford. Throughout her career, Stowe used literature as her father used his pulpit to shape public opinion. Rooted in common sense, democratic values, and her own experience as a woman and a mother, her views mirrored and appealed to those of the plain average. She urged the nation to civil disobedience, challenged religious orthodoxy, and dared to discuss incest, all in the name of motherhood, Christianity, and democracy. Writing at a time when women were denied the vote and had no representation in Congress, she used literature to have a political voice without betraying her socialization as a true woman. Speaking nationally to an increasingly heterogeneous public and paying attention to dialects, racial differences, and regional customs, Stowe contributed to the elaboration of a national culture and to what El Elaine Moores called the American real. Always controversial, Stowe fell into disrepute in the latter half of the 19th century. When literature became professionalized and more formal, aesthetic standards of art prevailed, and Stowe's passion and finely honed rhetoric were judged, melodramatic and sentimental. Her strongly marked characters, particularly Uncle Tom, were seen as stereotypes, an impression increased by the minstrel darkies of the Tom shows that continued into the 20th century. Her reputation rose again in the wake of the women's movement of the 1970s, Uncle Tom's Cabin, continues to be read around the world for its principal defense of the lowly and oppressed. The next article is taken from wikipedia.org on Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe died on July the 1st, 1896 in Hartford, Connecticut, 17 days after her 85th birthday. She's buried in the historic cemetery at Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts, along with her husband and their son, Henry Ellis. Multiple landmarks are dedicated to the memory of Harriet Beecher Stowe, located in several states, including Ohio, Florida, Maine, and Connecticut. The locations of these landmarks represent various periods of her life, such as her father's house where she grew up and where she wrote her most famous work. The Harriet Beecher Stowe House in Cincinnati, Ohio, is the former home of her father, 
Lyman Beecher on the former campus of the Lane Seminary. The father was a preacher who was greatly affected by the pro-slavery Cincinnati riots of 1836. Harriet Beecher Stowe lived here until her marriage. It is open to the public and operated as a historical and cultural, cultural site focusing on Harriet Beecher Stowe, the Lane Seminary, and the Underground Railroad. The site also presents African-American history. In the 1870s and 1880s, Stowe and her family wintered in Mandarin, Florida, now a neighborhood of modern consol consolidated Jacksonville on the St. Johns River. Stowe wrote Palmetto Leaves while living in Mandarin, arguably an eloquent piece of promotional literature directed at Florida's potential northern investors at the time. The book was published in 1873 and describes Northeast Florida and its residents. In 1874, Stowe was honored by the governor of Florida as one of several northerners who had helped Florida's growth after the war. In addition to her writings inspiring tourists and settlers to the area, she helped establish a church and a school and she helped promote oranges as a major state crop through her own orchards. The school she helped establish in 1870 was an integrated school in Mandarin for children and adults. This predated the national movement towards integration by more than a half century. The marker commemorating the Stowe family is located across the street from the former site of their cottage. It is on the property of the community club at the site of a church where Stowe's husband once served as a minister. The Church of Our Saviour as an Episcopal Church, founded in 1880 by a group of people who had gathered for Bible readings with Professor Calvin E. Stowe and his famous wife. The house was constructed in 1883, which contained the Stowe Memorial, Memorial stained glass window created by Louis Comfort Tiffany. The Harriet Beecher Stowe House in Brunswick, Maine, is where Stowe lived when she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Her husband was teaching theology at a nearby Bowdoin College, and she regularly invited students from the college and friends to read and discuss the chapters before publication. Future Civil War General and later Governor Joshua Chamberlain was then a student at the college and later described the setting. On these occasions, Chamberlain noted, a chosen circle of friends mostly young, were favoured with the freedom of her house, the rallying point being, however, the reading before publication of the successive chapters of her Uncle Tom's Cabin and the frank discussion of them. In 2001, Bowdoin College purchased the house together with a new attached building and was able to raise the substantial funds necessary to restore the house. It is now open to the public. The Harriet Beecher Stowe House in Hartford, Connecticut is the house where Stowe lived for the last 23 years of her life. It was next door to the house of fellow author Mark Twain. In this 5,000 square foot cottage style house, there are many of Beecher Stowe's original items and items from the time period. In the research li library, which is open to the public, there are numerous letters and documents from the Beecher family. The house is open to the public and offers house tours on, on the hour. In 1833, during Stowe's time in Cincinnati, the city was afflicted with a serious cholera epidemic. To avoid illness, Stowe made a visit to Washington, Kentucky, a major community of the area just south of Maysville. She stayed with the Marshall Key family, one of whose daughters was a student at Lane Seminary. It is recorded that Mr. Key took her to see a slave auction as they were frequently held in Mays Maysville. Scholars believe she was strongly moved by the experience. The Marshall Key home still stands in Washington. Key was a prominent Kentuckian. His visitors also included Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. The Uncle Tom's Cabin historic site is part of the restored Dawn settlement at Dresden, Ontario, which is 20 miles east of Algonac, Michigan. The community for freed slaves founded by the Reverend Joshua Henson and other abolitionists in the 1830s has been restored. There's also a museum. Henson and the Dawn Settlement provided Stowe with the inspiration for Uncle Tom's Cabin. 
Stowe is honored with the feast day on the liturgical calendar of the Episcopal Church USA on July the 1st. In, 1860, in 1961, Stowe was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. On June 13, 2007, the United States Postal Service issued a 75 cent Distinguished American Series postage stamp in her honor. Harris Stowe State University in St. Louis, Missouri is named for Stowe and William Torrey Harris. In 2010, Stowe was proposed by the Ohio Historical Society as a finalist in a statewide vote for inclusion in statutory hall at the United States Capitol, but Thomas Edison was chosen instead. This comes to the conclusion of the show. You'll be able to read it on our blog and in the next NHEG ED guide coming out on March 1st. Thank you for listening. You can reach me by email barbara b at newheightseducation.org. Be sure to join me every Sunday at radio.newheightseducation.org as I discuss civil rights. Also join Olan Yun Tabet's pre recorded radio show, which airs by Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and Pamela Clark's pre recorded show, which airs Wednesday by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Civil rights is our right. Have a great week. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org, for monthly announcements and other happenings.